Um, so thanks for joining us uh, tonight, everyone. Happy to be here, happy to talk to you about um, something that's a little bit uh, depressing or sobering, but important for us to know about, which is the African crisis uh, and that's affecting vultures. So we call it the African vulture crisis. You probably have heard about it. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the research we started when I was at Denver Zoo. Um, now I'm at Butterfly Pavilion, but I also have a little nonprofit organization called um, the Coalition for International Conservation. And I do a lot of work through them and through an organization in Botswana called uh, Raptors Botswana. So I'm gonna share my screen here um, and hopefully this will work. Here we go. Can everyone see that? Awesome, um, yeah. Okay, so yeah, my main, um, my main affiliations for this talk are the Coalition for International Conservation in Colorado State University. I'm an adjunct up there at Colorado State where I have graduate students. Um, I don't teach, but I do um, supervise some students, uh, particularly studying things like, like tarantulas and butterflies. So um, kind of no, more along the lines of things I've been doing more recently. Um, so the way I'm gonna kind of structure this talk is I'm gonna talk a little bit about the research we're doing and how to get started. This research has been going on for about a dozen years. So some of the work is a little bit older. Some of it's much more recent. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the research that's just being finished up now by one of our graduate students. So we have, um, we have a great team. I'm gonna go to that. How does this forward, let's see. This is our, this is our Raptors team, Team Raptors. Uh, we have a big group of people that are um, part of it. Uh, they are mostly people from Botswana, a couple people from South Africa, and then me from America. So um, <clears throat> for those of you who don't know, um, and some of these are grad students of ours that we've had over the years, like Becky and Sayoni and, uh, and Komoso. So um, if you don't know, there are really eight species of vultures in Africa that are now listed as from vulnerable to critically endangered. And these species have undergone incredible declines over the past maybe 20 years. And it's very, very, um, very scary situation. These are nature's cleanup crew. They are the recyclers of the environment. And if we lose them, it's gonna have a devastating effect on the ecosystem as a whole. We've seen that in India where they've lost 97% of their, their vultures. Um, they've had all kinds of problems developed there, such as an increase in mammalian scavengers, especially wild feral dogs. Um, that then spread diseases like uh, canine distemper uh, and basically have created havoc in the ecosystem. So um, the work that we've been doing in, in Botswana has focused on these five species, the lapid face vulture, the hooded vulture, the white backed vulture, the cape vulture, and the white headed vulture. And for those of you who aren't aware of where Botswana is, you can see that little red dot in the upper right hand corner of the map and that's in Southern Africa, just above South Africa, just east of Namibia and just west of um, Zimbabwe. So it's a landlocked country. It's mostly comprised of the Kalahari, which is not a true desert, but it's an arid ecosystem for sure. And then up north, it has the Okavango Delta, which most people have heard of, and the wetlands where a lot of the wildlife is concentrated. So let's see, let's see the players here. Let's see some pictures of the actors. So in the upper left, we have the lapid face vulture. In the center, we have a cape vulture. And those are our two biggest vultures. Cape vultures are actually a little bit bigger than the lapid face vultures. Um, they're both quite large. Uh, <clears throat> much more diminutive is the white-headed vulture on the upper right, but beautiful animal, um, if, if you allow me to say that. Most people think of vultures as, or they have this opinion of vultures as being ugly. I, I actually like them a lot. I think they're pretty cool looking and, um, the white-headed vulture is a particularly striking example of a vulture, if you ask me. The lower left is the white-backed vulture, and then the lower right is the hooded vulture, which is the, the smallest of these, of these vulture species. And you'll note that their bill shapes are quite a bit different. And if we want, we can talk a little bit about how that separates them ecologically. So they play different roles with the big lapid-faced vultures ripping open carcasses. Same with the white-headed vultures, which come in and eat bones and such. Um, and then the hooded vulture with its very diminutive bill that picks up scraps 
that are left behind when things like whiteback vultures and cape vultures go en masse and, and really devour a carcass. So what, let's jump right into some of the research we've been doing. So what have been some of the objectives of the work we do? Well, we've wanted to look at movement patterns and habitat used by vultures. Um, basically, most of these species are poorly understood. At least they have been in, in the last, um, last decade or two, maybe. And more recently, people are starting to study them in much greater detail, um, especially in Kenya and in Botswana, also South Africa. We also want to look at nesting ecology. We're very interested in population trends because, of course, we've seen across the, the continent that vulture populations are declining at a very precipitous pace, which is really bad. And then we want to look at why. Why are they, why are they dying? And we're really looking at sources of mortality, and we focused in on a couple here. One is lead toxicity, and the other is poisoning. So um, <clears throat> I wanted to talk a little bit about the research. We use these, um, when we look at habitat use and movement, we use these um, satellite GPS units, and we use them from a bunch of different makes. Um, we use a backpack design that we put around with Teflon um, strapping. We found this works quite well. It lasts quite long, and we've had vultures with backpacks that have lasted for um, over a decade. So we're getting, we're getting great data. Um, the first thing we had to do was learn how to catch these vultures, and it wasn't easy at all. So we started off with these walk-in cages, which we were told work really well with vultures on the upper left. But to be honest, we never got a vulture trapped in that, in that cage that we built. We put carcasses in there. They're very wary. They're very smart. Um, and it was a lesson of frustration trying to get them into the walk-in cages. So we shifted gears and we went to this cannon net that you can see in the upper right. Um, and then we disguised it as a bush, as you can see in the lower left. And that cannon net shoots a cannon, um, shoots a net, sorry, that's weighted with heavy weights over what, where we put a carcass and then traps vultures. Again, you'd be surprised how long it takes vultures to come into a carcass. And seeing that bush and that net on the ground make them very weary indeed. And it was, um, it sometimes takes days, literally, for vultures to come in to a carcass once we have it set. And sometimes we have to just move entirely because we're not getting any kind of interest at all. But it does work after a while. I'm going to show you some videos because it's kind of fun. Um, well, first, I'll show you some stills. Uh, you, you want to make sure that things like jackals, you see that black backed jackal up in the upper right, are not in the picture. We don't want to catch them. But we can catch multiple um, birds at one time, which is a great way for us to get the data we want to um, collar, not collar, radio tag a bunch of animals and then put wing tags on even more. So we also um, get population, population estimates and dispersal information by putting wing tags, pedageal tags on, on the birds. Um, and we've published some papers on different methods of tagging um, because we think we've, we've kind of come up with a great way to do it that works really well, basically from work we've done in Mongolia on scenarius vultures. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, so here's a little video to show you how it works. This is an old video from when we first started having success catching vultures from a, a decade ago. And you can see there's marabou storks, there's vultures, the net shoots. We're gonna see it again in slow motion. Pretty cool, you get a bunch of birds. Um, you gotta run out because they will get out from under the net. You can see them running around and uh, you got to get out, hold the net down and then extract the birds and uh, process them as fast as possible, especially if it's hot out. So um, you'll see here in a second, uh, one, of our, one of our researchers coming in and um, there he is and constraining the animals. Um, And then you want to stake down the, the carcass because you have things like hyenas in, in Africa and jackals and lions, and they'll try to steal your bait. They'll try to pull it away. So just a quick little video showing, oh man, um, there's a lot of different critters out there. You got to be careful. Uh, I, I remember setting the cannon net one time and I was running the cord with the detonator switch. And uh, I walked by this bush and I heard this low growl and there's a lion in the bush. So I Kind of slowly backed up and hopped in the car so it's a it can be a, um, a tricky place to work at times obviously we don't want to catch lions or hyenas that's no fun um, but i'll show you another video of captures because it's just i think pretty cool from the next year when we started getting white-headed vultures 
So we targeted different vultures. We've actually moved since then to these vulture traps where we just do leg holds and we target specific individuals more, more carefully and get one, just one or two, because we've basically gotten a lot of the data we wanted. Um, you can see one of the tag birds in the center of the screen, um, 99, a whiteback vulture. Um, and so again, we catch quite a number of birds at one time. In this case, we got one of our prize um, target species, which was the white-headed vulture, which has not been studied really um, before we started this study, at least using telemetry. And you can see the team rushes in. We use a large number of people to process the animals as quickly as possible. There's Dave Kenny, our vet, um, in the foreground. Becky, a grad student in the background. Um, there's Becky with her Denver Zoo garb that we gave her, um, but she's, she's uh, African and with a white-headed vulture, pretty cool stuff. And then we process the animals. So we do a bunch of things. Um, you can see Dave monitoring the bird to make sure it's okay. We put the patagial tags on and we give them um, alphanumeric numbers that are unique, put them on each wing because sometimes they do lose them. We put leg bands on, which are more permanent and stable. We put on that backpack unit. You can see it there. It's got a, um, it's got a solar, a little solar panel on the back of it. So that's why it lasts so very long. The battery recharges a, a number of times and can last for several years, as I mentioned, before it finally fails because it only has a number of recharges in it. Um, we try to put in a, um, a part of the, the backpack unit that can wear away. And so that over time, what will happen is this backpack unit will fall off the animal so that the animal isn't constrained to wear this for the rest of its life. Um, and then we take a bunch of morphometric measurements. You can see that in the lower left, we're measuring the, the bill there, but we measure wingspan and primary lengths and um, tarsal lengths and all kinds of stuff. Um, and then we draw some blood and we, we draw that blood from a number of birds. And you can see in the bottom left where we have a little portable lead uh, monitoring unit that can assess lead, blood lead levels, blood lead levels, sorry about that. Um, we weigh the bird and then we let them go. The whole process takes five to 10 minutes. So we actually move through them very quickly. We usually have three teams working simultaneously. So even though we might catch as many, I think the most we've caught um, that weren't able to get out at one time was about 24. So we're able to move through them at a pretty rapid race rate um, and get them out and, run, and flying free in no time. Um, and these are the kind of data we get. So. Um, you can see here that uh, we've gotten three cave vultures, which are um, critically endangered. And you can see their movement patterns and they go well beyond the boundaries of Botswana. You can see there's South Africa there and then Zimbabwe. The hooded vultures on the upper right where we've, we've tagged five of them going into Namibia, Angola, um, Zambia and Zimbabwe. So it's really become an international project um, because these vultures don't recognize, of course, country boundaries and fly all over the place. We got a couple white back vultures and we're really starting to focus more in on them in, the, in recent years. And I think we're gonna try in March to catch a few more white back vultures to try to get a feel for where they're moving. And again, they cross the boundaries. The birds that don't move very far are these white headed vultures. And previous research suggested that perhaps the white headed vultures were more constricted to protected areas than the other vulture species. And as you can kind of see in this slide, that, that that light green is actually a protected area. And indeed, that protected area is where the vultures spend the vast majority of their time, as you can see. And so they really do seem to be somewhat constrained to protected areas. So um, kind of cool data, um, working on writing that up right now. And then we've gotten the most out of our, the most data from lapid face vultures because one of our grad students was studying them for, for um, her PhD. And again, you can see these animals move huge distances. These are, these are hundreds and hundreds of kilometers from way up in Mozambique, um, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Angola, Namibia, um, South Africa, and Botswana. Um, and they've really, so it's just two different slides um, or, or images, I'm sorry, one on the left showing all the data, the one on the right showing recent data. They can really zoom in and you can see some of the movement patterns more clearly by just following those dots 
you can see how far they move in a straight line at one and a single shot. So they will actually get up and fly quite a bit, quite a long distance in one shot at one time, which we didn't know. Nobody knew if these birds were the same birds or different birds in different countries in which we worked. They also then, when we attach these uh, units, we include what we call mortality switches to them, which is just simply a little bead of mercury. When that bead of mercury stops moving back and forth across the unit at, for a certain number of hours, it sets off uh, a change in the frequency with which the telemetry unit sends its signals. And we know then, and we get a, we get a, um, a message that the bird has probably died and we go and find it. And that enables us to then determine the cause of death for that bird, which is very useful, of course, um, as you might imagine. Um, so we also did looked at nesting ecology, and we did that in a couple of ways. So we were very interested um, in understanding, basically, if nesting rates were the same as they've been over the past um, couple of decades, and what were the success rates of birds that nested. So in some places, we, we conducted aerial surveys. This is for birds that mostly nested in tops of trees and high trees. And then for cave vultures, we did ground surveys in the Swapong Hills because they're a cliff nesting species. And so we could go climb and um, look across valleys with um, spotting scopes and get a good, good, good data on nesting success rates and actually just number of birds that are nesting. So get some indication of population trends. And you can see we use these gyrocopters, which are very slow moving and, and very helpful indeed. You can see um, an example of a nest with an egg in it um, up on the top and then on the bottom, you can see Sione, one of our grad students who's doing some of the work with the cave vultures, um, looking at this, you can see the big nesting colony across the valley from her with all the whitewash on the walls there. And, um, pretty impressive birds and um, in, a, in an area that we've helped establish a protected area around so that those nesting vultures um, receive protection from disturbance during their nesting period. So you can see from this slide, this is old, these are old data, but um, you can see that people did some work in the, in the early 2000s. We started um, replicating that work in the mid 2000s, 2000 teens. And we found that nesting success rates and number of nests had both declined dramatically. And so this is worrisome. Um, this is in the Makatakati Pans, uh, which is in the central part of Mongol, um, Botswana. And um, you can see some of the pictures of images of the chicks and how they start out very small on the lower right, but then they get quite large later. So we, we replicate these surveys several times over the nesting season to then get an uh, idea of how many birds successfully fledged a chick. Um, and then in some places like Kwai, we found stable populations where in other places like Linyante up in the North, um, we found a, a major decline in nesting raptors. Again, we were comparing work from the early 2000s with work that we did in the teens. And um, it was kind of uh, sobering to see this loss of, of nesting raptors. Um, we also then took that same work and looked at what we were seeing with the cape vultures. And you can see that um, the nesting rates varied dramatically. And actually, the vultures disappeared from the site in the, in the late 90s for a few years before they recolonized. Nobody's sure why. Um, people think it was disturbance. But the good thing, again, is we did create a protected area to help protect these birds during the, the critical nesting period. So we're seeing a rebounding in the population. And I'll talk a little bit about that rebound um, next, I think, um, after I talk about nesting success rates. So again, you can see that um, over the years, that nesting success rates have really dropped. Um, nest rates, so you look at 2017, we also have data that I don't have on this slide from 2018, 2019, 2020, and 2021. And it's, it tells the same story that we're seeing a, a lower number of nests built, but what we're really seeing is a huge drop off in the success of the nests. And we're seeing um, and finding chicks at the bottom of the, the cliffs that have the leg and um, skeletal deformities. So what we started doing there was providing bone fragments at a, um, at a 
vulture restaurant where the vultures can pick up more calcium. We're thinking that they're not getting enough calcium, um, which means they're not getting enough bone. And um, in the last two years, we've really seen a decline in the number of chicks with these bone deformities. So we think this, this method of addressing this loss of uh, rigor in the chicks is really having a, a beneficial impact, which is, which is exciting. We're also modeling nesting success rates as part of the research that some of our graduate students are doing. So again, this is with uh, mostly with the Cape vultures to start with. Um, you can see that they're cliff nesters. So you can take a bunch of um, different um, parameters that are associated with the, the potential nesting areas, such as topography, the land uses, uh, characteristics such, such as the, um, the aspect or the direction the cliff is facing and then predation disturbance. So there are nesting um, black or varix eagles in the same habitat, and they do prey on um, fledgling vultures. So it's a, it's a potential problem. So we, we do this, we look at a suite of different environmental characteristics and it's enabled us to look at where are some of the best nesting spots for the vultures. And um, you can see the two, if you look carefully, you can see the two kind of vulture icon um, spots where we know we have good colonies. But if you look at that dark brown, that's really the good nesting habitat. And we've seen since we've been protecting the vultures in those two spots that I have labeled that more recently in the last few years that we're starting to see colonies of cave vultures pop up in some of the other areas that we predicted they might, which is kind of, again, very satisfying to see that some of this work is bearing fruit in terms of our ability to monitor where these vultures might go next as their populations rebound. So what are some next steps? We are providing food and, and crushed bones. I'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, we're continuing to nest monitor on a regular basis. And um, we started a bunch of um, human dimensions aspects to our work, evaluating attitudes and values towards vultures and their nesting colonies. We're working a lot with kids, as you can see here. So um, that's been fun um, and it's really just getting started. We've also done raptor roadside surveys. So there's a bunch of surveys in Botswana done in the early nineties that covered a big part of um, the country, 55,700 kilometers. And the Harrimans who did this saw almost 14,000 individual raptors covering that area. And um, we replicated this um, from 2016 to 2018 in the, in the north and 2019 to 2021 in the south. Altogether, we drove um, 43,500 kilometers and we saw quite a few, quite a bit fewer number of, of raptors, just a little over 9,000 rather than close to 14,000 of 35 different species. And the different colors just um, represent, the blue is the northern um, work, was one of our grad students, the red, is a Southern work, which one of our current grad students who's just submitted her, her master's thesis and the yellow are, are uh, routes that got replicated from the Harrimans. So the Harrimans did all those, every color you see there. And then we replicated that work in two stages. So what did we find by doing all this work? And, and basically what we did is we drove along the road at a very slow pace with a driver and an observer and tried to identify every raptor we could see and used um, grid cells that you can see here to kind of standardize the work and the populations of birds. So we're really, really looking at um, comparative work rather than uh, population estimates. So what these are are indices of populations rather than populations of cells. And they give us an indication of what's happening to populations over time in Botswana. And again, the, the results are a little sobering. You can see the bottom part um, are the decreases, which is the vast majority of species have shown um, decreases. If it has little stars next to its name, it means that decrease was significant. Um, and then an the upper part of the slide are increases. And um, again, if it has little stars, those are significant increases. The colors um, represent whether a species is of least concern, considered vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered by the IUCN. Um, and I think what this slide is telling us is that some of these species 
probably require a revision in their um, assessment by the IUCN in terms of whether or not they're threatened or endangered. Certainly, things like redneck falcons, lesser kestrels, and, and shikras um, deserve probably to be listed at least in Botswana and probably range wide. But we just don't have a lot of good data from other countries. So let's zoom in on this a little closer. Um, the, the bold are the significant changes. I'm, I'm looking at just vultures here, um, trying to separate out them from the other birds we looked at. And you can see some of these declines are, are pretty significant um, or very significant, uh, very large indeed. Things like lapid face vultures didn't change much, nor did hood, hooded vultures, but we saw um, a pretty big decline in white-headed vultures. Um, I'm going to show you this with in a graphic form because tables get a little numbing. Sorry about that. So here we go. We can see white back vultures have increased significantly. Lapid face vultures have stayed the same pretty much. Um, so that's a good sign for the white back vultures. We're not sure why it's the case um, because throughout the rest of their range in uh, Africa, they seem to be declining at a, at a very rapid rate. And so it could be um, that there are more road kills, for example, because Botswana has been paving a lot of their roads and that leads to higher uh, vehicle uh, velocities, more collisions with um, livestock primarily. Then the vultures come in, feed on the livestock that's on the road, a car comes and whacks them when they try to get away. So we think um, that, that when they try to fly away, some of the vultures get killed, but we think that actually that food, if it gets dragged aside, which is what's happening now, um, off the road, it's providing additional food that's maybe leading to an increase in vultures. We're not sure. White-headed vultures have declined significantly, as I mentioned. Hooded vultures have declined, but not significantly. And cave vultures have increased a lot. And um, again, we think in the case of Botswana, it really has a lot to do with the fact that we're now protecting the nesting habitat and we're providing supplemental bone and, and, um, and food for the cave vultures. And so we're seeing a, a huge decline in the rate of the young with deformities and a huge increase in nesting success rates in the cliff nesting cave vultures. And so you can see that's a, that's a really huge difference. Um, even though the population size count per hundred, it's not, not as big as some of the other species. The change from early to, to, to late season surveys is um, orders of magnitude and um, pretty exciting. So why, why are we seeing these declines? You know, people want to know what's going on. And po poisoning is the number one threat to vultures in Botswana, probably. Um, we say with the question mark, we're not, we're not sure, but I'm, I'm pretty confident myself. Um, and there's really two kinds of poisoning. There's incidental poisoning. And that's when you have, um, especially ranchers going out and poisoning either um, a carnivore. So they'll kill a lion that's killing the livestock and then they'll poison the carcass. Or if a lion kills a cow, they'll poison that cow carcass if they get there in time um, to try to get the lion. And of course, the vultures get back to that lion or to that cow first. And you lose literally scores and scores, sometimes hundreds of vultures. Um, then there's intentional poaching. That's by poachers who are going for things like elephant uh, tusks and rhino horns. And we call it sentinel poaching because what they're doing is they're trying to kill the sentinels. And law enforcement uses circling vultures as an indication that something big has died. And they'll follow that to check and see what it is. And oftentimes they find the elephant that's been poached. And the poachers know this. So what they've done, they've gotten actually quite wily. A lot of times now they'll cross the border into Botswana um, or move into, but or if there are Botswana, which is rare they'll go and they'll kill something like a Cape Buffalo. They'll lace that Cape Buffalo carcass with poison. Then they'll go off several kilometers to do their poaching of elephants or rhinos in a different area, having already attracted most of the vultures away and law enforcement to an area where they're not poaching um, the animal actively. So it's, really it's a really bad scene for sure. And you can see that bottom, that bottom image is just really, um, devastating in seeing the numbers of animals. So we've displayed 26 um, transmitters from 2012 to 2020, um, seven vultures. We found seven of them dead. Um, some of them have slipped their, their backpacks. 
but most likely um, all, or at least a majority of them came from poisoning. It's hard to be 100% sure, but we're pretty confident that for the lapid face vultures out of 18 or 22% died from poisoning. One of two white backs died from poisoning. One of three white headeds died from poisoning and one of, of um, three hooded's died from poisoning. Um, that's because what we do is we find a scene like you see here in the image um, above and we find a whole bunch of dead vultures and one of them is our tagged vulture. So the other thing that these telemetry units do is they help us find a poisoned carcass faster. So um, if a, one of our backpacked animals flies into our carcass that's laced with poison and kills it, um, it kills the vulture, we'll get that mortality signal. We'll get there because we'll go to, we want to find out as soon as possible. We want to get that dead animal as soon as possible to find out the, the cause of mortality. And we can then clean up the site, which will prevent the poison of even more vultures. Because as you can imagine, if you don't know that an animal or a carcass has been poisoned, that carcass can stay on the landscape for days or weeks and continue to um, exact a toll on that population by killing more and more vultures. The vultures will also come in and start eating other dead vultures and animals like um, hyenas and, and jackals that died from eating the poison, um, the poison bait. So, um, so we know that at least 45 lions have been poisoned um, since 2015. Um, and their carcasses, that is, have been poisoned because we found them. That's a lot of lions um, and it's killed a lot of vultures. Previous to 2012, um, this is going back decades. We had like 200 vultures that they've been found poisoned by farmers, 109 that were poisoned by uh, poachers and 136 unknown. And you can see that the five years after 2012 and we, we stopped collecting data um, after 2017, but you could see that the number killed by poachers that were out, out after elephants, you can see an elephant carcass here, went up hugely from 109 to 792. So poaching by poachers um, that are going for elephant tusks and rhino horns is really alarming and something we really need to stop. It's, it's challenging um, though, and I'll, I'll explain that a little bit. So this just shows you some of the sites where the poisoning takes place um, and the source, of the source of the poisoning. A lot of the poisoning takes place on the border because people come across the border to poison. But there is some poisoning that occurs in some of the um, in, in the central part of the country as well. So it's not just poachers coming from outside of Botswana, but primarily it is. Another thing we wanted to look at was lead poisoning, and we know we knew, of course, that lead poisoning was a problem with California condors in America, and nobody was thinking that lead was a problem until we started doing our work and we started looking at. Um, when we did these cannonet captures, we could get blood from large numbers of animals quite quickly and then um, sample that. So uh, we found, again, we have pretty big numbers here that 330 had, um, or 60, 70, almost 70% of the vultures had relatively low blood blood levels, but a relatively high proportion. So about 30%, um, a little more had blood blood levels that were too high, basically. And I refer to these as the walking dead because, or the flying dead, because these animals almost certainly will die. Um, there's, our, there's our students collecting blood. Um, there's our uh, lead analyzer, our portable lead analyzer. And what I threw in here was a slide from some of the work we've done in Mon Mongolia and Korea. And it's interesting to note that in, in Mongolia, where there is no or very little limited hunting, um, blood lead levels are very low. And those are 2.47 um, micrograms per deciliter in Cenarius vultures. We did the same work in Korea where there is hunting and you can see the lead levels are much higher. And then in Botswana where there's even more hunting, the lead levels are, are quite a bit higher. And I threw in this quote from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention because they basically said that there is no safe lead level. So the Centers for Disease Control puts out guidelines in America for what are safe levels of different um, toxins in people's blood. And they're saying basically zero. You can't have any lead. It's really bad for people. It's really bad for all living critters. Lead has no role in living organisms. So it's a bad, bad, 
um, presence on the landscape. And so how does it work? Well, it, it lead bullets fragment. And this slide is just showing again that we have relatively high lead levels in a large number, a large proportion of vultures, and that we found significant differences in the hunting season outside of the hunting season, especially in hunting areas. Um, and you can see that top right uh, image shows a, a lead bullet which fractured into just tons of little tiny fragments. And if you look at a radiograph of a deer that's been shot with a lead bullet, and you can see that here, it scatters throughout the, the, the whole organism. So even if you remove the area where the animal was shot, um, which of course poachers aren't doing, people aren't doing, that lead is scattered and strewn throughout the body of the cavity of the animal. And one little fragment of lead is enough to kill a vulture. We also tested water and we found some very elevated levels of lead in four of 12 uh, tested wells that uh, we went from an acceptable level, although it really is, as I mentioned earlier, there really isn't an acceptable level of 0.1 uh, micrograms per liter um, to 0 0.30. So um, basically what we're finding is lead's a problem and we need to do something about it. And there's luckily good solutions to this. So one is this idea of eventually trying to get a lead ammunition ban. And of course that hasn't worked at all in this country. And we're trying to work very hard in this country on voluntary um, compliance by hunters in condor uh, habitat to steer away from non-lead bullets these non-lead bullets often have a better killing power than lead bullets. They do cost a little bit more, but we're talking pennies on the dollar. And so for someone who's spending thousands of dollars to go hunting, it shouldn't be a barrier to entry. Um, you do have to recite in your rifle, but that's, that's something that every hunter should do every year anyway. So we really think we need a hunting ban. Um, what other things we're doing? Well, we're working with the, the Botswana Defense Force including their special forces to thwart poisoning. So when we find, uh, when we get a mortality signal, we let the Botswana Defense Force know so they can get to that animal quickly and then follow up and track the poachers. So it's one way we can try to help a little bit. But really um, one thing that's happened quite recently is that the special forces have been pulled away from anti-poaching work by the new president of Botswana. And that's a, to me a little bit disturbing because these poachers are well armed much better armed than the rangers who we um, send out to protect our wildlife. We need to protect more breeding colonies. This includes both those on trees and those on cliffs. As I mentioned, we already be begun this process with Cape vultures. We've set, helped set up a protected area and we've worked with local communities on protecting some of the other areas that are not formally protected, but are on um, private land or communal land anyway, that is really regulated in terms of who goes into that land. So we've started to really protect colonies. We started, as I mentioned, vulture restaurants, we call them. You're probably familiar with that term, but we're places where we put out safe food for vultures. We've established only two so far, and only one is open to the public. And you can see pictures of that one that's open to the, to the public here. Um, it's also a great opportunity to educate people and we have a major, major education program that I'm gonna talk about in a second. We also want to explore this creation of vulture safe zones. This is something that India is finding they're having good luck with is they've sent up uh, vulture safe zones. In India, it's a little different problem. They have a problem with a veterinary drug called diclofenac or, or, or other people pronounce it, pronounce it differently, diclofenac. Um, but it's, a, it's a, a medicine that's used to treat um, arthritis in um, livestock, but it kills vultures through massive kidney renal failure. And so um, what they've done in these vulture safe zones is banned the use and they've really, um, of, these, of this diclofenac and its sister uh, medicines. And they've really gone out and enforced the banning of these medicines in these vulture safe zones so that, um, so that the vultures have a chance to recover. In the case of Botswana, we're not so interested in, or not so concerned about the diclofenac, although it might become a problem if it's ever um, used widely. We're more um, trying to create vulture safe zones where there's no lead used and where we really ramp up anti-poaching activities. 
And then I was, was going to mention our community outreach. Uh, we, we work with kids. We have a, a rugby club that actually um, advertises vulture conservation on their jerseys. <laughs> uh, the name of the national team of Botswana for rugby is the vultures. So they have been very good about letting us put our propaganda in favor of vulture conservation in their, in their stadiums. Um, we're going out to communities and talking to them. And we're finding a lot of traction here. Um, most ranchers realize that vultures do play an important role for them by cleaning up their dead carcasses and getting rid of the um, potentially diseased animals and stop that from spreading to the rest of their, their livestock. And they realize if they lose vultures like they have in India, then they have to go through the big expense of carcass disposal themselves. So we're finding traction among ranchers, especially game ranchers. So people who raise a, um, antelope for a living, for example, they um, have switched, a lot of them have switched away from lead ammunition when they, when they harvest their animals. And so that they have uh, little lead secondary poisoning. Um, they don't lace their carcasses anymore because they realize they're hitting vultures more than they're hitting the carnivores. So we're having some luck there, um, but the poachers are, are a lot harder to get at, as I mentioned. So um, I'm gonna wrap it up there. Uh, I, we've had a lot of people support us over the years. Um, here's, a, here's a few of them. Um, I'm uh, definitely open for questions. I see some stuff in chat. I'm gonna stop this share so you can see me again and open it up to questions. Um, I don't know how this works out out to you. Just let them yeah. on so I go to chat. So yeah, if you want to look in chat or I could just read them to you. I mean, I think I think it was interesting and, and it's important to remember that you're looking at Botswana, that this is, I mean, this is happening across Africa, probably at the same scale to some extent. Uh, and and so it's it's just alarming you know, to see the population trends, but um, it's, it's possibly, and, and happening really, at a, possibly happening at a greater level because Botswana, about 40% of Botswana is protected. Oh, no, that's, that's a very good point. Yeah. And most countries um, don't have anywhere near that level of protection. And it's, and it's interesting because I know, I know, um, you know, the cultural feelings about vultures differ um, across the world. Uh, you know, but my wife and I always kind of like vultures. It's it's fun to see them come back to Colorado from their their migratory routes and and all that stuff. Um, but so the first question um, early on was um, a question about the the capture nets and the rocket nets. And do you see damage? Do we worry about feather damage? You know, the blood feathers and things like that when we're when we're catching animals like that. We, you know, it's interesting, but we have not had any problems with um, feather damage. Most of the feathers that you see after a capture are um, more the down feathers that come out, um, okay. or feathers we pluck to make it easier to draw the blood. Um, but in terms of like big primary, secondary uh, tail feathers, we didn't see any breakage at all. And we sure. caught hundreds of vultures. So. It's surprising, but they're tougher than they look. Yeah. Well, and we've, and I, I was just watching some video of vulture competition over a carcass and they're not gentle with one another. And, and hyenas come into these kill sites and, and pull vultures off the food. And you're like, I can't believe the vulture comes back after that. Yeah. And, and they're very persistent and they're very hardy birds. Um, and so another question down the road was kind of talking about the, uh, the improvement of roads in Botswana and how that may be increasing roadkill and that potentially whiteback vultures have a, a population kind of increase in relation to the, um, the increase in roadkill food in Botswana versus outside Botswana or outside areas where roads have improved, where they're focusing more on, you know, either, either um, carnivore or predator killed prey that gets into the cycle of poisoning by the, the ranchers, by the livestockers, or the poaching that may be occurring in these areas. And so do we think that the, 
the white back vultures in other places are more but that uh, you know more prone or more likely to encounter these lead based poison based carcasses than in these areas where roads are providing food you know roadkill that's not being tainted by human interaction right i mean that's a good question and and, and it's it, it's not clear to me that we know the answer to that question it's something we want to research a little bit more and we want to talk to our colleagues in other countries certainly there are more road kills of things like donkeys and cows in Botswana now that they've paved roads and that's feeding more vultures I worry about the vultures getting hit by cars as I mentioned but sure. on the other hand in other countries surrounding Botswana and Namibia there's a lot more people so Namibia has the second lowest human population density of any country in the world after Mongolia. And Botswana is not far behind. There's only 2.8 million people in Botswana. So oh, maybe wow. because there's so few people on the roads, less vultures get hit by, by cars and they get more food. And so the population is increasing. Um, and then in other areas, um, maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe they've been, those carcasses get poisoned. Um, by poachers and others who are after. So there's a thing I didn't talk about, which is moti, which is kind of witch doctorism. So um, vulture parts are very valued um, in, that, in that realm. So people sometimes go into nests and kill fledglings, but also they'll, they'll poison a carcass to, to kill the vultures to get the body parts, like the, the feet oh, okay. and And so that might be happening it's not as big a practice in Botswana as other countries. So it very well could be that in other countries, when they find a carcass, there's more likely to poison it so they can get those body parts to sell for moti. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting to look at, you know, so much of science is gathering the data before we can start interpreting it. And it, it can be really frustrating to get this, this data and realize that you need to start moving and something needs to start happening, but you're not exactly sure where in that, that realm of conservation or mitigation you need to focus. Because, because of, oftentimes it's not like a red flag that just pops up and is very obvious amongst all the confounding factors. So yeah, to be honest, most countries don't have the resources, including Botswana, to do the kind of monitoring that they should be doing. And so yeah. it, some of this, some of these data come to light later and we notice like in the case of vultures, you know, very late in the decline that the decline is more serious than we anticipated. Yeah. So another, another kind of question, like, um, so we're looking at lead poisoning and how, you know, lead ammunition ban, even though it's, it's not as successful as we'd hoped in America, it is making some difference in some areas. Um, and it's always a, a game of inches sometimes. Um, but in, in Botswana, obviously this would be beneficial. And I think what I heard you say is that we're starting to see um, when ranchers or, or other livestock managers are, are putting down um, animals, they're, they are switching away from lead uh, to some degree. But when we're, when we're talking about the people that are going out and poaching, obviously they're looking for the, the biggest bang for their buck. And so we're not really marketing to poachers, hey, you need to spend a little bit more on ammunition so you're not using lead because in some respects, they want to attract the vultures away from their primary kill, um, and then they want to get rid of those sentinel animals. Uh, and then also, um, they're not really concerned with the vultures in the long yeah. term. Yeah, yeah, so. Yeah. I mean, I think that if we can, if we were able to ban lead and make it harder to get, even the poachers would switch. But that'd have to be a global ban, which is going to be incredibly hard to implement. Um, yeah. But the like you said, I've had some of the ranchers come up to me and say, you know, I don't use lead bullets anymore because my family eats this meat and I don't want them eating lead. Yeah. And they don't want to feed it to other people as well. 
So that's a good long-term trend that we're starting to see this kind of evolution in the mindset of the local people saying, I don't want to, I don't want to use lead in the food that I'm procuring for my family or for sale because it's potentially toxic or is toxic if it has lead in it. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, it's a hard, it's a hard sell for the hunter, for the hunters. Um, <laughs> oh yeah. Well, as a, as a wild style hunter myself, you know, you hear the conversations about what, what is the lethality behind lead versus, you know, um, I forget a steel shot and the, and the, it's, it's not that it's necessarily less lethal in, in my opinion, or my understanding. It's just that your, your hunting style and your hunting mentality has to change around the ammunition you're using. And, and so, um, you know, it's, it's not that it's less lethal because a, a bullet hitting you or a pellet hitting you as a small bird or a certain animal is going to do a set amount of damage. Um, it's just the idea of ranges and shot concentration and things like that, that really speaks to the lethality of the ammunition. Yeah, some of the ammunition, they've done studies and some of the, especially the synthetic bullets have are much more lethal. They have a greater killing power than lead even. And so, um, it, it does change sometimes the trajectory of the bullet changes a little bit, but again, you should be sighting in your rifle every time you use it anyway. Um, it's a little more expensive. I admit that, but again, given the cost that most hunters spend on things like their rifle and their scope, um, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be a barrier there. Um, I yeah. just think it's change, you know, change is hard. And <laughs> it is. It is. People it don't is. like change, and they worry about it, and they worry about this and that, and they don't trust the science. Always, science is under siege um, across the country now, and it's actually better accepted in Botswana than it is here. Let's put it that way. Really, I find <laughs> greater acceptance. I find greater acceptance in Botswana among ranchers and hunters than I do here. Yeah. So, so we had another question about vulture feathers in particular, and okay. the the flexibility. Um, when you when you when we're talking about vulture feathers, are we looking at them more along the lines of like a red tail that might have like flexible feathers, or you know, uh, like a peregrine falcon that might have more rigid, brittle feathers? Um, yeah, they're do they a little fall more into flexible. one of those camps? Yeah, they're a little more flexible, I would say. Okay. They're not as rigid at all, and you can see that when they fly with their feathers, you know the. the these the old world vultures, you can really see the feathers bending more than they do like in a falcon. So that's maybe why we don't have any problem with the uh, breakage. We really have never had it happen. Yeah, that makes sense. And so I, I think that looks like we're more or less at the end of the questions. Okay. Um, someone um, got a thanks to you. They've heard this talk uh, through the Denver Zoo. And they really okay. appreciate your work. Um, I guess there was one more question. It sounds like uh, Botswana uh, is really dependent on researchers um, to some extent from America and maybe um, Europe and other areas supporting this work. Is there, is there an idea that if, if this work wasn't supported through conservation, um, uh, NGOs or societies in America and those places that this work would stop? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, a lot of the money comes from Europe and, and the US, no, no question about it. Um, a lot of the work has been done in the past by expats, but that's one of the reasons we're training young um, Botswana, both um, black and white Botswana students because it is a it is a racially diverse country, um, believe it or not, um, but mostly black students, um, and sending them to schools like especially University of Cape Town that has an excellent program for um, ornithology, really good, the Fitzpatrick Institute. Um, so we're trying to build up numbers of local people um, who can do that work themselves. So a lot of this work has been done by Botswana. 
plus okay. ones, um, which is great and the way we have to go. Um, it's also one of my goals is to get more women involved in conservation in places like um, Botswana. So that's why most of our students have been women, um, although we've had some men as well. And so um, the work is becoming more and more um, increasingly generated by local people, which is the way it should be. But the, but the resources do primarily come from the US and, and, um, and um, Europe. And um, yeah, if anybody out there wants to support it, you can always support um, through my NGO, which is a nonprofit here and get a tax write off. It's a 501c3, it's a coalition for international conservation, CIC. Um, and there's a way to donate on the web and the money, 100%, I don't take any overhead, goes straight to, um, to Botswana and Raptors Very Botswana. Cool. So if people wanted to support, they could. So um, we do support through that NGO. We support, I send money over every year that I raise um, in various ways, so. Well, great, thanks, Rich. Uh, I'm gonna, we're gonna wrap it up there. If anybody wants more information about how they could support Rich or learn more about these vultures, um, that would be great. Reach out to myself, reach out for the CFO board, you know, hit us up on the website and we'll be happy to help facilitate that. Um, but again, thank you very much, Rich. I really appreciate your time tonight.